Hello there, welcome to this first edit, which is gonna be a composite of these two images. This is gonna be our background image, and then we're gonna be superimposing this guy who's doing all these acrobatics onto the road here. So you can immediately see this is gonna be challenging, but it's gonna be a lot of fun, but we cannot simply start this process without understanding some important things, okay? Let's open the the steps sheet that you must have got your hands on, okay? The uh, compositing step sheet. Now, here, there are a couple of steps, right? And within some steps, there are these mini steps also. So kind of think of them like different phases, selecting compatible images, cutting out the subject, creating the sense of realism, and finally the adjustment. So these steps are obviously gonna come later. In fact, they are a lot of fun to do, okay? The issue, the toughest part, of creating a composite is actually in this first step, which is selecting the correct images, which are compatible with each other to form a composite, okay? For example, how have I decided to choose these two images? What made me choose these images? So first of all, this is definitely a trial and error process. That's why it's slightly tough and frustrating, but we can reduce that degree of trial and error by understanding some of these important points. Okay, so let's start this process I'm gonna open Photoshop. I have got this background image here, okay? One of the first things that, so let's say this is the background image. Now I wanna hunt for a subject, like a portrait, which I feel will be compatible to make a composite with this one. So what are the points that I would look out for, okay? One of the most essential things that you have to look out for is when it comes to the horizon. So you can see here, that is the first point. It's also called as the vanishing point. And I'll tell you why it's called the vanishing point because this concept is gonna be important. But one of the important points is that if you can find that subject image in which the horizon level is similar to this image, it's a good chance that you'll be able to easily form composite. Why? Because that would mean that the perspective is similar. If the horizon level is similar between the two images, there's a good chance that the perspective is similar and perspective being similar is very important to form a real looking composite. Okay, so let's actually see this action now. For example, in this image, you can clearly see where the horizon is. So some images, you don't have to do any work to find out the horizon. Your eyes are enough. Wherever the C ends here is the horizon, right? But what about the subject image that we will see? So let's look at a couple of different subject images, okay? Let's see, first of all, uh, this particular image. Now I've made a selection here, so you can't see the background. So I'm just gonna disable this mask. I'll talk about selections later on. Okay, it's not too important right now. I'm just gonna disable this layer mask so you, we get rid of the selection temporarily. You can actually see the surroundings of this particular image. Now, the question is, can I use this girl and transfer her hair and make a real looking composite? Let's find out. So, remember the first point? We are still on the first point, horizon vanishing point, but they're the same thing, okay? Just different names. So, how can we find where the horizon is so that we can kind of come to know, you know, is it, Similar to this, if we were to then, because when you put this sub, okay, when you put this subject here, we will have to put it in such a way that both the horizons match each other, okay? They are on top of each other, they're superimposed. So, in this, can you see the horizon? That is the question. The answer is no. Then how do you find out where the horizon is in these cases? Now, usually, okay, one of the golden rules to find out horizon when you cannot see it is it's usually at the eye level when you shoot someone. Okay, now the problem here and why we can't say that we can simply use an eye level and say this is the horizon because if, can you see, this is the eye level. Does this feel like the horizon? Not at all, this is the sky, right? Then where is the horizon? And why can't we use the eye level here? Because if you notice this shot, hasn't these, this been clicked from a down to up angle? Almost feels like the photographer was crouching when they took the shot. So this is not a normal eye level shot. So we cannot use that eye method. The horizon is not gonna be on this line. So where is the horizon? This is where the concept of the vanishing point comes into play because what happens is that if you have any lines which are parallel to each other, also called as leading lines in photography, you must have heard that term. Uh, very often it's a very common way to even compose shots, leading lines shots. If we take and extend these two leading lines which were supposed to be parallel in real life, they actually converge at the end exactly where the vanishing point is, exactly where the horizon is. 
Okay, so what I'm trying to say is, let me just do one thing. Let me take the crop tool here. Let me extend the canvas of this image, okay? And now we just have to find out two parallel lines here. So can you see this? Let's say, let's assume this is some sort of a frame of a window. This is most likely to be parallel in real life, but can you see it kind of appears to be converging? So that's how we see things, okay? So if I was to take, let's say this line tool here, okay? So I take this line tool and I just draw a line like this, okay? And it doesn't have to be too accurate, okay? You're just gonna guess where the horizon is with this technique. So let's say I make something like this, I hit enter, it's gonna turn this into a black line and we can't see the line right now because the width of the line, you can see the settings of the line on top is set to one pixel, we can always increase that, okay? Let's create one more line. So I'm gonna hit any of these options so that I'll get rid of the line option. And now we're gonna again open the line. This time, let's take maybe this one, okay? And now let's draw this. So, something like this. Again, doesn't have to be too accurate, but something like this, I hit enter again, okay? So, oops, yeah. So now you can see this point where these two lines are intersecting, somewhere around this. I'm not saying exactly here, because we might have slightly gone wrong here, okay? But somewhere around here is where the horizon is. Okay, so, and we just have to get the approximate, okay? Because once we shift her over, we, we can eyeball things a bit, at least as long as we've got an approximate idea. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take a third line and, okay, so just, okay, okay. We're gonna take a third line and I'm just gonna, I can actually even use the ruler tool in Photoshop. I'm not gonna do that all that right now because right now it's just, we're understanding things, okay? So let's say I do something like this and hit enter. Somewhere, so you can see, somewhere around her knee is where actually the horizon of this particular shot is. So just remember that, okay? We don't have to worry too much about these lines. I'm just gonna hide these lines. What I'm gonna do right now is I'm gonna enable that selection again, which I have made already, enable layer mask. Like I said, don't worry about these selections. Also, I'm just gonna get rid of this whole cropping thing that we did. And we're back to our original selection. What we're gonna do right now is we're gonna take this over to this particular image, okay? Now, first of all, of course, this is too big. I'm just gonna slightly zoom out. I'm gonna hit Control or Command plus T. That is gonna bring these transform tools here, okay? Now, remember what we have to do? We have to match the horizon of both the images, right? Let's try to do that. So remember, her horizon was somewhere around the knee, okay? So let's try to do that. Let's try to scale her down a bit and something like this. Can you see, she does, it, because we're following that horizon strategy, she does, it kind of feels like yeah, she is standing there, but everything else looks very unreal. That's because the perspective between both the shots was just too different to be following the strategy. If the horizon levels are too different, okay, this strategy is still not gonna work. Okay, because that shot has been clicked from a down to top angle, and this just feels like a normal shot that someone has clicked you know, just standing or maybe just at a tripod near the eye level, okay? So you can see, kind of looks okay, but it just looks off when it comes to the realism part of it. So if you look at the next point here, okay? You can see here, angle of the shot. These two points are actually kind of, they're talking about the same thing. I can actually put them together. They are the same points that if the angle of the shot is too different, the horizon or the vanishing point is not, even if you match them, it's not gonna work in your favor. So one of the first things that you have to look for is that the horizon levels are as similar in the area, in the frame as possible, which was not the case here. Here it was very down, here it was very up, which is again basically happened because of the angle of the shot being different, okay? So this is one of the things you have to look out for. Fine, now let's get rid this image, let me quickly also show you another image like this. For example, if this was our entire environmental image, sometimes you can't see the horizon there also, right? But now can you guess where the horizon is in this case? You can kind of guess it's gonna be somewhere here, but if you're confused, you can always take your line tools, draw, because remember these buildings, the lines there will be parallel to each other in real life, okay? So these are proper leading lines and you can kind of go ahead. So any image, you can see the horizon is right here, okay? So any image, if you have these leading lines, 
you can easily find out the horizon. Some images, you can see the horizon. And some images, you just have to kind of eyeball things by looking at where the eye level of the person is. These are the three ways to find out where the horizon is. So I hope that you got that point. Now let's look at another image, okay? So we know this one doesn't work. Now let's look at this particular image. I'm gonna disable the layer mask so that you can see the environment again, okay? And let's see what's happening here. Right, so now in this case, you can clearly see that the horizon is somewhere here, okay? If I, even if I was to draw lines, you can kind of see somewhere near her shoulder is where the horizon is, okay? This definitely seems like it has a better chance of matching with this, but let's see, okay? So we are gonna enable the layer mask and I'm just gonna shift this over here, okay? So now I'm just gonna use my transform tool to Quickly transform her, zoom in a bit, and let's try to place her, okay? So remember, her horizon was near the shoulder, somewhere around. So now we can eyeball things. Let's say something like this, okay? And now, this kind of looks better than the last image. And don't worry about the other things, okay? We are like adding shadows and all we're gonna make, when we actually do our edit, we're gonna make it absolutely real, okay? Just making some points here. That you can see now because the horizon levels were similar, this kind of looks off a similar perspective, right? So slightly better, but then what is off here? Why is it, why isn't it still looking? And again, don't keep the shadows point right now. That is the technical part which will come later. What are some of the other things which are not looking real here? One of the things you can straight away notice is the quality of light is so different, right? So let's look at our step sheet and see what the next point is, which is direction and quality of light. We don't have either of these here. There's first of all no direction of light here because this is in soft light. This kind of, if you see this image, okay, if I disable the layer mask, you can see this has been clicked on an overcast day, whereas our environmental image is a proper tropical looking image with hard shadows clicked in sunlight. Obviously, this is not gonna match. So we need a subject which is also being shot under harsh lighting like this. The direction of light is not so important from the point of view of it being left to right or right to left because we can always flip the image inside Photoshop. But the point is, it still has to be directional lighting because you can see the shadows are towards the right. So the sun is somewhere here, okay? Like this, it is directional lighting and also the quality of lighting is harsh. So we cannot use this image because this has neither of those, right? So we cannot use this. Now let's look at an image which we can use. So if I show you this third image, I'm just going to disable the layer mask here. And you're gonna see this image now has a much better chance. Harsh lighting, sun in a similar place. Even if the sun was this side, okay, we can always do something like this. Okay, we can always go to edit, transform, and flip horizontal. And the shadow will come this side. But the point is, the important point is that it has to be directional so that we have a similar looking lighting. Okay, so if I was to now enable this layer mask and now take this person over to this, okay, also we should not forget, we have to still see the horizon, right? So we're gonna disable the layer mask just to see where the horizon is. Now this time in this image, you can see, just right under his uh, elbow here, okay? So something like, just move in, something like this, okay? This would probably fit, with, now don't worry about this, it's kind of not looking real because we, in the selection, okay? I've just accidentally cut his feet and all. But like I said, we're not worrying about that. So this will work better because there are two things that are helping us here, okay? The horizon and the angle of the shot are similar to the environmental shot. The direction of quality of the light is similar, okay? And I'm gonna be talking about these other points also. But overall, as compared to the first two images, this is gonna work much, much better for us, okay? Now, it's still not looking that great because there are some other points to consider. So let's also look at them. One is depth of field. Is there any difference in the depth of field, okay? So let's look at this image. This is pretty much a sharp image from uh, you know, front to back. So there's no depth of field issue. This image also is front from, so this is not like an image where, where the background was blurred, for example. Let's say if the background is blurred here, you've taken a shot with a lower f-stop number, a wider f-stop number, wider aperture, the background would have got blurred, then it's not a good 
compatible image for this because it has to be sharp in both the images from front to back. So depth of field is also not an issue. One of the issues is this fifth point, which is scale, okay? What do I mean by scale? Because this image has this tree in it, now we have to be very careful about scaling the subject, okay? Like right now, this kind of guy, okay, he almost feels like a giant in the screen. So what we can do here is we can scale him down, but remember, we have to keep the horizon right here. And if I just start scaling like this, okay, so if I scale this person like this, he'll move, even if I have to get him small. So how can we scale by keeping him near the horizon level? So there's a trick that we'll be using when we start our proper edits, okay? Do you see this point here? So whenever you use Control T, Command T, you get this reference point in between, okay? If you're not seeing this, this is, you can, okay, let me just get rid of this. You can always go to Preferences, can go to tools okay and here under tools just make sure this option is selected show reference point when using the transform tool okay so just check this so I've already checked it here so if I hit control T or command T again now I can tell Photoshop I want to scale this person but I want to scale him in such a way that he stays fixed to this horizon it should always be near his elbow because that's where the original horizon is so what I can do is I can just place this point somewhere on the horizon here. Now, if I, before moving this, okay, before clicking my mouse on this, if I hold down Alt, okay, if I hold down Alt or Option, and if I reduce the size, can you see? It's gonna scale, but it's not gonna move from that reference point which is near the horizon, okay? So what scale means here is that we have to kind of use or make him smaller or bigger in such a way that that reference that we have with the tree on the side, it looks real. There's also a chair on the right. Okay, I'm gonna zoom in there. It should not look like that this guy is a giant. Okay, because that is again gonna distort the realism. The perspective might be good, but even these things can hamper the realism. Okay, now something like this. Okay, now if I zoom in, can you see? This kind of starts to now look like a real composite. Of course, there's the lighting is off, the luminance values are off. All that is handled in phase three or step three. That is a different part. Here we are just searching for the compatible image. Can you see now this starts to look kind of real? In fact, to be frank, if you now compare it to the chair, he still looks slightly off because this, can you imagine such a big guy sitting on this chair? No. So we probably have to again slightly hold down Alt option and decrease further. But the problem now what is happening is he's moving away and away from the scene in order to you see, now it looks really real, right? But what's the point of creating such a composite when our subject has gone so far away from the scene? So here, everything worked for us, but because we had this chair and the tree in the scene, we had to make this person really small in order to get a real composite, which kind of doesn't, now there's no point in doing this because it's so far away. So this step can also render something not worthwhile, okay? Uh, so just giving you some examples that what all you have to think of, you know, when you do things. Uh, also, this last point, which is not right now, too important. Do these two images make sense? You have to ask yourself that, okay? So for example, what I'm trying to say here is, do these two images make sense? Absolutely yes in this case. Why? Because this person was originally on a beach, right? And this environmental image is also of the beach. So. The last point is absolutely perfect because what happens is when someone sees this, okay, one of the things by which your image can feel off is because of technical reasons which we've discussed before, but also because of logical reason. That if we had, let's say, a person in a tuxedo here, right, that wouldn't make any sense. And that can also create doubts of mind in a viewer who doesn't know it's a composite. And then they can start looking out for other wrong things, okay? So this point, Right now, from a course point of view is not important. That's why I've written, not required as a beginner. As a beginner, till the time you're getting used to this process, don't worry about this point. You can even put the tuxedo person there because you're learning how to do this technically. Once you get good with this process, of course, this is some a point that should come in your mind, okay? But you can see, right, that it's not such a straightforward process. But overall, this looks fine now. And if we were actually editing this image and we don't mind the scale, this would be perfect to go on to the remaining steps. 
Okay, so that is the process that you use. Again, I'll be, we'll be going through this process again when we edit more images. There also I'll show you a lot of different variations as to why I didn't choose something, why I did choose something. Having said that, now that at least you have some idea for it, we are gonna start the process because we are gonna be using these two images and now you can kind of get an idea why I chose these images. So let's quickly discuss about that also. Harsh lighting, you can see harsh shadows here, directional lighting, let's look at the subject image. Harsh lighting, directional light, okay? Then you can kind of see uh, the horizon will be like somewhere here, okay? Just down below here. If you see the horizon, it's pretty much at the similar level. So the angle of shot is kind of eye level. So there's not too from the top, not too much from the down. So this is gonna work from there also. What are some other points? Uh, so you can see these first three points are good. Depth of field, both are sharp, okay? This one, the second image might be just slightly blurred on the back here, just like you, you can see here where this person is, not this, but this person, yeah, it kind of blurs out till here. So yeah, that point maybe we'll think about, but I don't think it's gonna make too much of a difference. The depth of field really matters when the blur behind is too much, okay? Then it can slightly affect, but this, is not gonna to be too much of a problem. So this point also is good. Uh, what about the scale? The scale, so I've already tried this, okay? The scale looks perfect. And I'm, before I start this next edit in the next video, okay? The only sometimes, the only way to find out if the scale is not an issue is to actually just quickly, without even sometimes making the selection, quickly place the image on in Photoshop uh, by reducing the opacity of the top layer just to kind of get an idea whether things are working for you or not. I'm gonna be showing you that in the next video so that you quickly get an idea whether the scale is gonna be an issue or not. Uh, in this case, I'm not really paying attention to does it make sense, okay? Because a uh, person doing all these acrobatics wearing this, would such a person be here? Maybe, may not be, but we're not paying attention to that right now. In the next video, we're gonna start the whole process of creating this composite. So I'll see you there, bye for now. All right, so let's get started with our first composite edit, which as I showed you before, is this image and this image. I'm sure by now you already know how to get your hands on these images. Also, I'll just be talking about that I've already made the selections. You can actually open up the PDF, uh, the PSD file or the Photoshop document file, okay, so that you directly get the selection. I'll talk, I'll be talking about all this in just some moments from now, but what quickly I wanna do is, remember that part about scale. Sometimes you can't come to know and you don't want to make a selection and then find out that the scale was wrong. So what I told you even in the last video is that sometimes even before I make the selection, what I just like to do is, okay, you can just kind of like drag this image, let's say out, okay, and just place it here, okay. Just put it back here. Okay. So if I just take this, so it comes as a separate layer, okay. And what you can do here is you can just decrease the opacity of this layer. So you can kind of see both the images now, right? And this will just give you a fair idea. For example, if I just zoom out and I use Control T, Command T, Transform tool, to just kind of see, okay, will it look okay? Because you can see both, right? So you'll be able to make out, okay, if this person is doing this, yeah, from the scale point of view, I think we have no problem, right? You can even see, and this is kind of even a good practice to even just to see whether the perspective looks good. You can clearly see here, that he looks absolutely fantastic on the road here. So this is gonna really work in our favor. And then what you can do is, yeah, once you kind of know that the scale works, the perspective works, you can now, with peace of mind, work on the selection. Now talking about the selection, okay? This is a compositing course. So what I've done for you is, first of all, I've just made the selection, okay? I will be showing you how exactly I made the selection, but not right now. I'll be showing this after we have made the composite. So that we directly right now can get started with the exciting part because making a selection is not so exciting. Okay, it's kind of a technical boring job. So after we've done with the composite, I'm gonna show you how I made this very accurate selection and the outline of his body. So right now, I'm sure this has been explained to you before how you can open up the Photoshop document which gives you this with the layer mask, with the selection. If it's disabled, enabled, just make sure you enable this layer mask, okay? So that you get the selection like this. And then once we have this, we can transfer this person here. Also, we have to quickly see the horizon here, right? So let's just disable the layer mask. And we can kind of guess that the horizon here is gonna be, because so many things are hidden, right? We can't really see the horizon behind. But it's gonna be somewhere around this area, right? Because you can see. 
uh, near about the waist, we'll have to eyeball it uh, from there because we have two lines. I could have used it, but you can kind of see even without using the line tool, they definitely are going way above the horizon if they were to intersect. That probably means that these lines were not exactly parallel to each other in the real world. Okay, because if they're intersecting too high, we know that the sky is there. It's probably not a good idea to use these lines. So sometimes these things happen, okay? Uh, so we'll just have to eyeball a bit near his waist area. So I'm going to enable the layer mask again. And uh, no, actually we already transferred this image, right? So the horizon in this particular image is kind of somewhere here, right? Below these mountains in this plain area. So we'll try to kind of get probably something like this. And you can see in most of the areas, he is looking like he's on the road. But we'll have to play around a bit with the scale. So sometimes just move around the subject till the time you kind of feel they're grounded, okay? You will find that point where they really feel, you know, very, very grounded, okay? So it kind of looks, to be frank, something like this looks good. We can scale this, okay? Since we don't know exactly where both the horizons were, we can't really use that reference point technique here. So we can just scale normally and try to eyeball things till the time kind of get something which looks decent, okay? You're never going to get it exactly unless and until both the horizons were being seen, but something like this, right? You can see immediately now it feels like, yeah, he is on the road, okay? Also, before I get started with the other uh, steps in the process, just want to actually show you the final result that we are going for, okay? So we're going for something like this, right? You can see this looks pretty real, you know, even from a scale point of view, he's obviously ahead of the T, the tree, so he is going to be slightly bigger, so it doesn't look like a giant. Really looks grounded here, the perspective looks good. You've created these shadows, changed all things here, which we are ultimately going to do for this image also. Okay, so let's start this process by seeing what are the steps. So step two is done, which is cutting out the subject. We'll see that later. But now we are on the all important step three, which is creating the realism, which is going to start by creating the shadow. So we're going to do that in the next video. I'll see you there. Bye for now. All right, welcome back. So I've just slightly moved him up, okay? And I've just slightly scaled him down because, uh, and these are things you'll just have to do bit by bit till the time you feel, yeah, he just feels more grounded, okay? So I've just made some changes right now. Even if you don't do that, it's okay, okay? So, because we want to learn the other things. But basically, I'm happy with this. Now is the time to add, first of all, the shadow, okay? So how are we going to do that? Very, very easy, especially because this is, Harsh lighting, okay? So when is hard, what do you call as harsh light? When you can see the shadows are very defined like this, okay? So what we're gonna do here is, since we have this selection with the layer mask, right? We always have this layer mask, by the way. So the, even the selection is completely non-destructive. We can change anything in the selection anytime that we want. Even if you had a rough selection to start off with, you can refine it towards the end also because of this mask, okay? Now, what we're going to do is just select this mask and what we want is we want the outline of the selection to come back, those marching ends, okay? So how do you do that is with this mask selected, just hold down control or command and you'll see this cursor turn into this. Just click your mouse like this. So you'll see those marching ends come here. And then all we have to do now is we just have to fill this completely with black because that is what ultimately will help us in creating the shadow. Okay, so how do we fill this with black? We can simply use an adjustment layer here. If I click on the adjustment functions, which is called as solid color. So if I click on this, it will come on a new layer and it'll ask us which color do you want? Since it's a shadow, you want to just fill it with black right now, though we will change the color. In fact, we can actually change the color because what happens is, okay, so we'll do that later because I'll just be talking about the color of the shadow itself. It's not always 100% black as we're going to find out. So we are going to just right now select jet black. It's okay. And if I just click on okay. And now we just have to transform this. So since this is on a separate layer, right? We can like, literally I can move this around anyway. So I'm just going to undo that. Now we don't, so if I just hit control T or command T, like the normal transform tool, yeah, we can do things like that you know, this, and if I hold down shift, I can even like distort it like this. But what we want to do here is, okay, so again, I've just undo, you know, if I just undo that, and I'm just going to hit enter, okay? We don't need that transform tool, though what I'm going to show you can be done from the transform tool itself, but it's just easier for beginners to do it this way. So after you've selected this layer, you can see this particular layer is highlighted. I'm just going to hit edit. 
I'm going to go to transform, okay? And usually for shadows, we use this option called distort. You're going to again find it looks similar, but the only thing is when we move around these things, it just completely, as the name suggests, it distorts the shape, okay? So what you can do is like, for example, you can just take this middle one and like drag this here. This is usually good for shadows. Now, can you see all the shadows here are slightly pointed upwards, right? So we have to kind of create a similar shadow. So we've got that particular angle. You can play around with that, okay? Like this, and we wanna make it slightly broader, okay? And all that will be corrected later. For example, this is coming on top of this hand. Don't worry about that. Also, there's this road here, right? Which is gonna cause that little bump, which is also something we'll be doing slightly later on. We're just creating right now a very basic, hard looking shadow. I think I've just made it too uh, wide, so I'm just gonna slightly pull it down, okay? So I think that is looking fine, and I'm just gonna hit enter. We are gonna definitely decrease the opacity a bit, okay? So something like this, starting to get that feel, but can you see now that there's a difference in the color? Right? This kind of appears to be a bit bluish. And this appears to be a bit black, okay? So what we can do here is, if we just double click on this, remember this was the color fill adjustment function. If we just double click on this, we again get that palette. And this time we can just simply, you know, make a, a sample from this eyedropper. Now, the sample size, right? Do you see this option which says sample size? By default is usually set to either point sample or three by three average, okay? Mine is different because I use Photoshop a lot, I must have been editing something different. But here we want a very precise sample, like only where we click, okay? So something like even five by five average, three by three average, because it's basically talking about the pixels or the how much area is it gonna sample from, okay? So let's say we select something like three by three average and we just do this. And you can see at some point, okay, so we can even zoom in. So I'm actually just gonna close this first of all. So I can hit the the Z key, okay? Or you can hit the zoom tool from here. And then I can just drag this to zoom. Okay, we just have to make sure we're selecting that right color here, okay? So, just go double click and go select here. Let's see how this is looking. I'm just gonna zoom out actually. Okay, so we see both of them. And remember, we have decreased the opacity, okay? So the color may not look exactly. I think this is actually fine. Let me just see, uh, I'm hit okay. If I increase the opacity back, yeah, you can kind of see that this is starting to look similar to this color. Now, the only issue here is if I zoom into the shadow, okay, uh, this is kind of dominating the road, okay? It's not looking too translucent. A bit of translucency is there, you can see through the road, but that's only because we decreased the opacity, okay? So one of the things that we should be doing here is changing the blending mode of this particular layer. That means how it blends with the layer below, which is how the shadow blends in with the road. So we can usually, you're gonna find the answer will be in one of these families of blending modes, because this family is about darkening something. So we are saying, okay, let the dark parts win. Okay, now don't worry too much about it. You can even go through uh, these things, but I can click on darken. So we'll actually see what I mean by this is, okay, let me just do one thing. Let me put it to normal and actually let me not decrease the opacity. So now you understand what I'm talking about with blending modes. Now can you see? With the opacity 100, you can't actually see and that's not how a shadow is. A shadow is translucent. So you want to first of all make it blend by choosing one of these, okay? So for example, you can, you know, play it. This is kind of trial error. You can go through actually, to be frank, most of the uh, blending modes here, okay? But we don't also want to lose the color, right? So kind of darken works better because you can start to see the texture. And now if we decrease the opacity, yeah, you can really start to see the road behind, okay? So I'm gonna zoom out. And now the only issue is that we're facing is that it's not as dark as this particular shadow, right? because we've had to decrease the opacity and all. So what we can do is we can also slightly darken this by opening up a brightness contrast function. Okay, and if I move these two sliders, can you see? But right now it's affecting the whole image. We don't want that. We only want it to affect the shadow. So what we can do here is with this layer selected, the brightness contrast layer, we can right click and click on this option which says create clipping mask. Just see what happens. 
If I do this, do you see this layer has now an arrow next to it? So what a clipping mask means is now this layer is only affecting the layer which is directly underneath it, not these two layers. Which is the layer underneath it? The shadow layer, the colorful layer, okay? So whatever we do here with these sliders is only gonna impact the shadow. So just see, if I move this, you see, it's just making it darker. At the same time, we are not losing that shade of blue that the shadow had, okay? We can even kind of increase the contrast a bit till the time this starts to look like this, okay? So, we can now go here also, we can slightly decrease the opacity further and, and yeah, I think this starts to look really nice, okay? So, let's zoom out a bit and you can see we're getting a nice hard shadow. Like I said, the bump and removing of these things is something that we will uh, take care of at some point. The bump, we'll take care of it later. Okay, let me quickly just, you know, get rid of the shadow from his hand because it's obviously not going to come on his hand right here. Okay, so what we're going to do here is we're just simply going to mask this out. So what we're going to do is these two top layers, remember, they are forming the shadow. Okay, so we are going to select both of them and put them under group and we'll just call it if I double click on this group now, I'm going to call it shadow, okay? Now, for this whole group, we can actually create a layer mask. So if we open up a layer mask, now we can paint black wherever we don't want the shadow to be seen. So if we just take this particular brush, okay, we're going to select black and we can simply start to and this way, I would just like to decrease the hardness of it, okay? And okay. Don't have to be too precise here, okay? So you can see here, this was pretty easy, okay? And also, like things like, which are coming here on his hand, we don't want that, okay? All right, so now if you look at it, you can see that this st shadow starts to look Really, really nice, okay? So we'll take care of that part towards the end because we also have, if I show you this step sheet, uh, this final adjustment step has this step called checking everything. So these small things, sometimes I just like to leave it towards the end and especially for this course, because I wanna quickly show you the other steps also. But before we completely end the shadow part, there's always one thing that you will be doing just to enhance the shadow a bit, okay? Which is right where the, you know, if I just use the zoom tool, Okay, if you press Z, it doesn't happen. Sometimes just click on it and it'll come, okay? Always, after you've added the shadow, one of the things that you should be doing is wherever the hands meet the ground, here, like you can see here, there's bound to be like a slightly dark area here, right? Because of that slight shadow that comes, because of the contact. You also have to create that to add a sense of realism to this, okay? So, how can we do that? Now, the trick that I like to follow, now first of all, a lot of people out there simply take a paint brush, they select the black color, decrease the opacity of the brush, and just very lightly paint. You can do that, okay? But what I'm gonna be showing you right now is a way more automated process to do that. So let's see. So in order to do this, what we need to do is, first of all, we need to get that selection back, okay, of this person. I'm just gonna slightly zoom out, just very slightly, okay? And still the time we can see the whole body. Okay, something like this. What we're gonna do is, we again gonna use that trick, remember, to get those marching ends back, the whole selection, we're gonna do this. Now, we're not interested to add this, we're not interested in this whole selection, we only are interested in the hands. So we, first of all, wanna find a way to remove the all the selection apart from the hands. How can we do that? We'll have to subtract from the selection. And for that, what you can do is just open up this lasso tool, which is usually made to use to make selections, Manually, you can draw a selection. But right now what we can do is if I just hold down Alt or Option, okay, so just see what happens to the cursor. Can you see there's a minus sign that comes next to it. So we can now subtract from this. So whatever I draw, for example, let's say something like this. I just want around that gloves and the palm area, okay, whichever is making contact. Something like this and just all of this. And it's just gonna basically take away entire selection part from these areas which we want. And then what you can do is, when this is selected, just hit Control C or that'll be Command C on a Mac. That is copying, we're copying this, okay? And so 
right now, it's actually not going to allow you to copy it because right now it's, we've not selected anything here. Remember, we selected this selection from the mask. A mask doesn't have any details. Where are the actual details so here? There's actually here on this. So make sure this is not selected. This is, you just use this to get that selection. But if we want that area, okay, we want the details in this because what we're going to be doing is we'll actually be copying and pasting these hands on a separate layer, okay? So those hands are actually on this thumbnail, right? This original thumbnail on which the layer mask was applied. So make sure this thumbnail is selected and then hit Control or Command C, that is copy and paste Control or Command V. If we do that, if we do this, you don't notice any difference, but just see a new layer has come here, right? Okay, this is, just let me show you, if I show you, if I take the move tool with this layer selected, we actually put the hands on a separate layer. All the parts that were making the contact with the road. So I'll just undo that so that it superimposes so that we don't come to know this. But now what we can do is if I zoom in, okay, just see this. If I right click on this layer and go to this option which says blending options, okay, is basically we'll be able to add what we call as a drop shadow, very popular in graphic design. So if I just hit drop shadow, can you see? It automatically makes your life easier because it gives you this kind of a shadow. Now you may not exactly be seeing this type of shadow because I've made some changes to this drop shadow. So if you just double click on this, okay, where it says drop shadow, you'll get like a separate dialog box where you have certain options. Okay, for example, what is the opacity of the shadow? What is the distance of the shadow? What is the angle of the shadow? You can change the angle also. You can, how much does it spread? What is the size? You can control everything. So now, first of all, let's keep the opacity to 100%. Right now, obviously, it's not looking good. Angle, we're going to play with similar to the angle of the light, something like this, because the sun is coming from that side. Okay, so we want the shadows kind of towards the right hand side. We can't really see the shadows because it's all spread. I'm going to decrease that spread, even the size. Okay, now you'll be able to see, right? You can see the direction of the shadow. It kind of looks good now. So maybe something like, so since the shadow is pointing upwards, uh, maybe something like just basically direction, like this, okay? And now we can change these values. Like how much distance? No, not that much distance. We just want that dark part just under his hands, like this, okay? So we can kind of choose a very conservative distance. Let's see with the spread. We don't want to spread it like too much. This won't look good. Okay, just it should appear that yeah, it's slightly dark. Like this is fine. Okay. And you can even control the size. Like that's just going to feather the edges like this. So that you can't see the edges properly. But the final change will come in the opacity because we don't want such a strong effect. So you can actually decrease the opacity. Just decrease all the way and start adding till the time you feel yeah, it's just added that slight bit of darkness like this. Okay. And that's all you basically need. So if I click on OK, just see the before and after. Before, after, before, after. Okay, if you still feel this is too strong, remember this is on a separate layer. So let's call it also so that we just maintain the thing that we're doing with the naming the layers. Okay, let's just call it palm shadow. Okay. All right. So this, and actually we'll just put this inside this group also since this is a part of the shadow. But Kind of it is spreading here. First of all, you can even open up a layer mask, reduce it. But let's see if we decrease the opacity, what happens here? Okay. Yeah, just this much, right? So just see the before and after. Just makes it slightly grounded. In fact, this is too strong. Maybe 70 would probably work out fine. Maybe uh, 71, okay? Let's try 60. Because this has to be very subtle, okay? Yeah, something like this. That you should, it's not even noticeable, but yeah, it adds that depth by just darkening that part. That's why you can see it's so subtle. That's why a lot of people just simply use a black brush and paint it. But I just like this approach. It just works uh, in a more automated way, okay? But now if I zoom out, of course, you'll probably not even be able to notice it, but you can still see it makes a big difference. And finally, since this is a part of this shadow group, right? So this should be kind of inside it, you know, just to maintain that nice workflow. We can just take this and drag it onto here. So it's actually gonna go inside all those layers, okay? So palm shadow, and you can see the other things are also here. So now, if we just take this group, looking at the image, just see if we hide the whole group, we did this and this, let's see it without and with it, okay? So this is without, this is with both the shadows as well as the palm shadow. 
I think this is starting to look really good. Let's quickly now see what is the next step. So if you're going to open our sheet here, you'll see that the next step is about changing the luminance and brightness. This is going to be a lot of fun. So I'll, for that, I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now. All right, so when we're talking about luminance or brightness, these words can be used interchangeably, okay? We're basically saying that is there any difference in the brightness of this subject as compared to the brightness levels in the background image? Because remember, this is of course coming from a separate image which might have a separate quantity of lighting, okay? So the quality of light was similar, but the quantity of light can definitely differ, right? So we kind of have to match them. So how can we do that? Now, a lot of people even eyeball this, they change the uh, luminance levels by increasing and decreasing the brightness on this person. We would like to do this more technically. And how you can do this is, if I go to the adjustment functions here, okay, if I open up a black and white layer, what will happen is, okay, this black and white layer comes on top. Viewing this whole thing in black and white just allows us to see the luminance values much more clearly. Okay, so when I say luminance values, what we're looking out for here is that in the areas that mainly we're talking about this foreground and the middle ground, okay, don't worry about the sky because this person is near these things, okay. So when it comes to these areas which are near him, does he look too bright? Do the bright parts on this person look too bright as compared to the brightest parts here? Do the shadowy areas, the darkest parts on him, do they look equal to the darker areas here? For example, in this, what are the brighter areas in the background image? You can kind of see this part here, okay? You can also see this part here. Also, when it comes to the darker areas, maybe you can see this is the darker area here. On him, the darker area is this. And on, on him, the dark, the brighter parts are this, the especially the top that he's wearing. So, brightest parts, brightest parts. Darkest parts, darkest parts. What do you notice? So, if you look at closely, okay, Sometimes it's going to be tough if you're a beginner to notice this, you'll get used to it, but you can immediately kind of understand this seems a bit more brighter than this, right? And this seems a bit more darker than this. So what we have to do is we basically have to turn down the highlights a bit. Highlights are the brightest parts in an image. On this person, just have to slightly take them down and do the opposite on the shadows. We just have to raise the shadows a bit so that it's not so dark then it's gonna kind of match the luminance values of the background, okay? So how can we do that? Now we leave this black and white layer on, but in order to do this change, we'll actually open up the ever reliable curves adjustment function, okay, on by going here. So if I open curves, now one important thing is, make sure this curves, you pull it all the way down and it's just above your selection layer, okay? Oops, I think I put it inside the group, so I'm gonna undo that. So. Just put it right here, okay? And even put it underneath the shadow group. The reason for that is, first of all, when we do any changes, it will reflect in the black and white layer also because this black and white layer is on top now. So this will take into account whatever changes we make here and I'll talk about this also, what this means. But right now I'm making a different point, which is put the curves adjustment layer right on top. Also beneath the shadow layer, the group that we have, why? Because we don't want anything that we do here to the luminance on the body to affect the shadow. The shadow is perfect as it is, okay? So now that we opened up a, cur opened up a curves function, a curves function looks like this. If you're seeing it for the first time, don't worry about it. It looks slightly you know, difficult to understand, but it's very easy. The right parts here, whatever you're seeing here, represent the brighter parts, the left part of this whole square thing that you're seeing represents the darker parts. If I was to, just see what happens, if I was to move this from the right part, if I just select this, can you see the luminance value of the whole image is going down? But it's mainly impacting the brighter parts of the image. So when I do this, I'm saying, okay, turn down the highlights, why? Because the right parts are the highlights. I can also increase the highlights by going like this. So can you see those skies and everything is becoming too uh, bright? This side is a shadow, so if I want to raise the shadows or make them slightly more brighter, I can do this. If I want to darken them, I can do this, okay? So this is how the curves function allows you to individually work on highlights or shadows and you can decrease them or increase them, which is exactly what we want to do here because we want to decrease the highlights, increase the shadows. But as you saw that when I was changing this, it was impacting the entire image, right? Now, you already know that how can we do this in such a way that it only impacts this selection. 
or basically this person. So you know the answer, we can create a clipping mask. So you always don't have to right click and click on clipping mask because in certain adjustment functions, you already get this option. Can you see here? Just under this thing, curves function, you can see the curves adjustment function already gives us this option. If I directly click on this, it just creates a clipping mask. Same thing, what would have happened if I would have right clicked and click on create a clipping mask. Now whatever I do, just see, whatever I do, it's only gonna impact that person, not the surroundings, okay? I'm gonna undo that. Now let's start the process. So first of all, let's tune or turn down the highlights a bit, On especially on the top, you can see here, you wanna match the luminance levels to something like this. So you just have to slightly take this down. So these are the highlights, we're just gonna bring them down. Keep an eye on the top, okay? So, you see? Something like this. Now, can you see? It really matches this level. Also for the shadows, we this time have to raise it. So we're gonna take the shadows and keep an eye on the trouser part, can you see? And we're comparing this to let's say something like this or this, okay? So something like this, fine. Now, of course you can't really make out anything right now. We're gonna just get rid of this black and white layer that was just for ref, uh, reference. So we've got rid of that. Now you come back and you immediately see that, yeah, now it starts to kind of blend in well. But this is not the final thing because we will be making some changes because I feel I've just slightly overdone this. No problem, this is on a separate layer, we can change the opacity. But just to show you the before and after, now let me just double click on this and let me actually just name, call it either brightness or let's call it luminance, okay? That, it's not necessary but it helps us later on if we need to make any changes to quickly select that layer. So if I hide this, just see this was the original. You can see that it was looking too contrasty, too sharp to the eyes. It is a sharp scene overall to be frank because it is harsh light, but still this was way too, it was kind of pinching the eyes. But when we do this, we just take away those luminance values which kind of just settles the contrast a bit and kind of makes it blend well. But like I said, I've overdone this because we do want a bit of that sharp contrast to come back, okay? So we're gonna decrease the opacity here of the luminance layer. So say something like, maybe around 55%, yeah. So just see the before and after now. It's gonna be a subtle change, but just see before and after. So we still retain that sharp thing, but the contrast is still good, but it still just blends in well. It's not standing out too much, that it's not hurting the eyes, the white reflections, okay, from the top. And even the shadows look much better. So before and after. Right, so very, very simple change, but very, very effective change. Now, similar to this, okay, we have the next point, which is gonna be color saturation. So we'll see how to do that in the next video. Bye for now.